heartbroken. I feel pain for my country. I feel pain for my family. It's impossible to even imagine that something like that can happen in this world, in this century. War erupts in Europe. Russia mounts a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in an unprovoked attack on a sovereign nation. Response from the Catholic world up ahead. Big news late this week about the Supreme Court as President Biden announces his administration's first nominee decide. for the high court. We versus I, how the misuse of one pronoun has invalidated thousands of baptisms. An expert in church doctrine joins us to explain how this happened and discuss the fallout now impacting so many people. A piece of linen, a work of art, or the burial shroud of Jesus Christ, we take you to an exhibit that unwraps the Shroud of Turin. EWTN News In-Depth starts now. Images captured from the rooftops and on cell phones as Russia mounts a full-scale attack on neighboring Ukraine in the biggest invasion in Europe since World War II. It's a move that could rewrite the world's geopolitical landscape. I'm pleased to nominate Judge Jackson, who will bring extraordinary qualifications, deep experience and intellect, and a rigorous judicial record to the court. And an important decision from the White House as President Joe Biden announces his Supreme Court nominee. Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson of the D.C. Circuit Court has been named to replace retiring Justice Stephen Breyer. Details from that Justice big story Breyer. coming up. We begin with the somber events on the world stage. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Details of the Russian invasion of Ukraine are fast moving and changing by the hour. This is the situation at the time we record this program. Russia faces condemnation from all corners of the globe following its invasion without provocation of Ukraine early Thursday morning, local time. Russian troops launched an all-out assault from the north, east and south, hitting cities and Ukrainian military bases with airstrikes and shelling. The Kyiv region's most powerful thermal power plant was a major target. Both civilians and military members are counted among the growing number of casualties. As Russian tanks and troops rolled across the border, they also recaptured the decommissioned Chernobyl nuclear plant, the site of history's worst nuclear disaster more than 30 years ago. It's in the direct path to Kyiv as Russian troops advance and threaten to overtake the Ukrainian capital. The assault by land, sea and air is Moscow's most aggressive action since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. NATO is branding it a brutal attack of war, shattering peace in Europe. The Ukrainians reacted to the invasion with shock. Most had never thought Russian President Vladimir Putin would act on his aggressive rhetoric. As shelling hit population centers, these people took shelter in a school basement in Kiev. Others took refuge in the subway. There were long lines at ATM machines as Ukrainians tried to access their own money and withdraw cash. And motorists queued up at gas stations as many others decided to escape to safer locations in Ukraine or to cross the border into Poland. That created massive traffic jams across major roadways. This is a dangerous moment for all of Europe, for the freedom around the world. Putin has committed an assault on the very principles that uphold the global peace. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. At the White House, President Joe Biden said Russian aggression cannot go unanswered. He announced the U.S. and our allies are levying additional economic sanctions, targeting Russian banks, Putin himself and Putin's inner cir circle, and imposing export controls. He emphasized U.S. troops will not be fighting in Ukraine, but that he is moving more forces to Eastern Europe to bolster NATO allies in the Baltics, Poland and Romania. In an extraordinary move, Pope Francis visited the Russian embassy on Friday to personally express his concerns about the war, according to Vatican officials. 
Popes usually receive ambassadors and heads of state. The decision for the Holy Father to leave Vatican City and travel to the Russian embassy was a sign of his anger at Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and his willingness to appeal personally for an end to it. Vatican officials say they know of no such previous papal initiative. Pope Francis has called for dialogue to end the conflict and has urged the faithful to set next Wednesday, which is Ash Wednesday, as a day of fasting and prayer for peace in Ukraine. The leader of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine and wrote, it is our natural right and sacred duty to defend our land and our people. He went on to say that we believe that in this historic moment, the Lord is with us. He is always on the side of the victims of unjust aggression. EWTN is a global network, and we're praying for our colleagues in Ukraine. I had the opportunity to speak with the Director General of EWTN Ukraine, Father Alexander Zelinsky, who's in Kyiv. He shared with us what the situation is like now and the desperate need for prayer. Uh, last night was explosion in the house, which is uh, two kilometers from from our house wow. where we uh, live. Yes, so so I I heard this this explosion and I I woke up in the, the, that moment. Yes, it was, I think, uh, 4 a.m. in Kiev time. Yes, it's not uh, easy. Yes, it's uh, uh, some stress for for us, uh, but uh, we also. Uh, really believe that uh, and that uh, God will help us to defend our country, uh, to defend our dignity, our freedom, and we uh, really uh, need also the help of, of uh, different people in, in the world. And Father, tell us about your plans. I know that you announced that you're going to be staying in Ukraine. Will others be with you? Is this a plan that is just for now, or are you staying there for the duration? Uh, yes, we, we are staying in, in Ukraine. We will try to to serve uh, uh, through the television EWTN uh, Ukraine. Yes, our mission now is is to uh, to give people and uh, the, the, this uh, possibility of this opportunity to meet with, with God also through media because mm. they need it they need this this prayer and we try to broadcast uh, masses uh, durations we try to to give them them hope so this is our mission this is our duty in this time and so we'll try to serve as long as we we will uh, could uh, to do it. Uh, uh, we don't know how it will be in the future, how long uh, uh, yes, this situation will be. We really now also experience uh, different signs of solidarity also from USA, from different countries who uh, were, uh, can try to help us in this situation, yes, because we really know that we are small we are little before the the russia russia is very big uh, country very big army we are small and we really need this this help well you might say that you're small but you're very important to us and we are praying for you and your safety thank you very much and for a broader look at the implications for Eastern Europe beyond Ukraine, we're joined by our colleague, the manager of EWTN East Central Europe, Ivo Bender. Ivo, you're in Poland, a country bordering this escalating deadly violence. Are people worried the Russian aggression could spread across the border? The short answer is yes. Uh, you know, uh, basically every generation of uh, Poles uh, for the past uh, probably three centuries has uh, experienced some sort of a conflict with Russia. Um, you know, I, I can speak even for my family history, uh, where my grandfather had to escape during the war because he was on a list to be sent to Siberia. So every Polish family has had a history like this. So, uh, and of course, we know that one of the few certain things in war is that they never play out the way they were planned by whoever started them. So yes, we are anxious. Uh, yes, we are slightly worried. Uh, there is no panic, but uh, people are, uh, are justifiably worried. Let's talk about economic impact. The moves by Russia will undoubtedly impact the rest of Europe, as Russia is the second largest producer of oil in the world and a huge source of grain. Are people hoarding supplies, filling up on gas? Is there a sense of panic? 
Well, there is no panic to speak of, but people are indeed uh, uh, stocking up on gas. Uh, we have uh, not very long lines, but you have to wait perhaps you know five minutes uh, at the gas station. So there's visibly more people filling up, and of course, uh, you know, of course, unfortunately, of course, people are uh, also stocking up on basic supplies. Uh, but again, uh, the shelves are not empty. It's just you can notice more people in the stores and at gas stations. And Ukrainians fleeing the war zones, they need help. Many are going to seek aid in Poland. Can you tell us about the resources being set up to help refugees? Yes, very quickly, there is already about 1.5 million Ukrainians in Poland who started moving here after the uh, first act of this Russian invasion back in 2014. Uh, so there are partially political migrants, partially uh, economic migrants, also a lot of students. But we are now expecting up to 4 million uh, Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Uh, Poland has opened its borders to Ukrainians. There is now a 10-mile line in front of the uh, Polish uh, border checkpoint uh, in, in the eastern part of the country. Uh, and Poland is getting ready in the uh, town of uh, Przemysl, which is the first uh, larger uh, town uh, right across the border from Ukraine. The local uh, train station was basically converted into a makeshift shelter where uh, Ukrainian nationals uh, can find a, uh, a bunk bed to, to sleep on before they uh, move on to meet with their families or to be uh, taken care of by the uh, Polish government or the Polish church which, in fact, has already announced that this coming Sunday and Ash Wednesday, all the Polish churches will collect, uh, collect money, donations, to help, uh, to help Ukrainians uh, fleeing this, uh, this aggression. Ivo, have you seen U.S. forces there? Is there any kind of collaboration from the U.S. government? Well, uh, I do not know if the uh, U.S. forces are engaged in helping the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, this is they are stationed uh, far away from Warsaw, right on the border, uh, especially in the uh, in the uh, southeastern part of Poland. Uh, so I cannot uh, confirm that, uh, but uh, I know that the uh, the increase of uh, of the U.S. military presence in Poland, especially with the uh, 82nd Airborne, uh, which is now. Uh, uh, dislocated in, in the southeast was really welcomed uh, by, uh, uh, by the Polish people. You mentioned four million people. Is that right? Yes, that is the, uh, that is the higher end of the estimate. Yes. And is that unprecedented for Poland? Is that something they've done in the past or a higher number? Right. Poland is a country of 38 million people. Right now we have probably 1.5 Ukrainians already. So that would basically mean, uh, if this indeed materializes, that uh, more than 10 percent of the population of Poland will be consisting of Ukrainian refugees. Of course, I hope that this will not escalate to that level, but this is the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the top end of the estimate. So of course, it will have tremendous in impact on basically every facet of Polish life. Let's talk about faith in, U in Ukraine and in Poland. The historic nature of the church is very strong in these regions. Is there hope because of that? Are you seeing that church leaders are responding in a specific way? Absolutely. Of course, uh, you know, we, we can say that, uh, first of all, our uh, sister station in Ukraine is broadcasting. They decided not to leave Kiev, even though they could. Uh, so they are doing their job, they're trying to go about their business as as much as possible under the circumstances being under under attack. Um, in so um, and also I know from uh, from from Ukraine that uh, the people are turning, of course, in a situation like this, closer to God. Uh, the Polish Church is uh, has been very vocal about condemning this unprecedented Russian invasion and also uh, about welcoming the refugees who, uh, who are coming to Poland and providing for them both spiritually and materially. Uh, basically, all the Polish churches are holding uh, special prayer vigils for, uh, for, uh, uh, for peace in Ukraine. Thank you so much, Ivo. We know that we have a call to prayer for us on Ash Wednesday as well. Yes, thank you. 
The Russian invasion caused havoc around the globe in stock markets from New York to Asia to Europe. Stocks plunged and then swung wildly. The Russian rubble took a major hit. Oil and gas prices surged. Worried investors are nervous about the long-term monetary effects of a war in Europe. Price fluctuations in Europe were sharper than those on Wall Street because its economy is more closely tied to Russia and Ukraine. Next, to all that important announcement affecting the makeup of the United States Supreme Court, EWTN News In-Depth will be right back. Plus, the Supreme Court agrees to consider another religious liberty case involving a business with faith-based objections to working with same-sex couples. The Pope speaks out about the tragic desperation of migrants losing their lives as they head for refuge in Europe. Welcome back to EWTN News In-Depth. The suspense is over. We have a Supreme Court nominee. I must begin these very brief remarks by thanking God for delivering me to this point in my professional journey. My life has been blessed beyond measure, and I do know that one can only come this far by faith. President Biden introduced Judge Katanji Brown Jackson at the White House Friday afternoon. The 51-year-old Jackson grew up in Miami, Florida, graduated from Harvard College, and went on to Harvard Law School, where she was the supervising editor of the Harvard Law Review. She clerked for Justice Stephen Breyer at the Supreme Court and, if confirmed by the Senate, will now replace her mentor. Jackson would diversify the court's legal experience because of her early criminal work as a federal public defender. On the bench, she served eight years on the federal district court in D.C. before being elevated last year to the powerful U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Amy Howe, longtime reporter for SCOTUS Blog, joins us now to discuss the impact this nominee could have on the court. Amy, it's great to have you with us. Judge Jackson clerked for Justice Breyer. Can we expect a similar judicial philosophy? I think she is likely to have a similar judicial philosophy, at least in the way that she votes, in the sense that, that replacing Justice Breyer with, with a Justice Jackson is not likely to change many of the outcomes of the court's cases, you know, she'll bring a different perspective. She's the first justice in a long time to have had a significant criminal defense experience, and she would be the first justice ever to have been a federal public defender. So when their justices are on the bench and in their deliberations, she'll bring a different perspective than Justice Breyer, certainly. And as the first uh, black female justice, she would also bring a di different perspective. Discussing the public defender record that she has, what what issues does the court actually look at that affect that that would bring that perspective with her that would allow for that to shine through? The the, the Supreme Court has you know a, a pretty steady docket of cases involving you know bread and butter criminal law cases, sentencing cases, and the the justices just don't have someone right now who has tried those cases from the criminal defense perspective. Justice Sonia Sotomayor was a district judge, um, and she was a prosecutor. Justice Samuel Alito was also a prosecutor. But they haven't had for a long time a criminal defense attorney uh, looking at the cases from that side, of, from that angle. Would that also affect uh, the death penalty cases? Uh, it would probably, it might affect the, the death penalty cases. She was a federal public defender in the District of Columbia, so she's not actually likely to have worked on any death penalty cases, um, but also not likely to change the outcome. But again, she would probably bring a different perspective. You know, many of the death penalty cases don't necessarily deal with issues directly related to the death penalty, but are coming to the, the Supreme Court because of some criminal law angle that the, the death row inmate is trying to raise at the Supreme Court. So in that sense, it might also affect, affect the cases. Amy, then what's next in the process? What can we expect from her confirmation hearings? So right now, after the, the, the official announcement, then Judge, now currently Judge Jackson, will start meeting with senators. There are 
courtesy calls to senators, probably trying to meet with as many as possible, in particular, the senators who are on the Senate Judiciary Committee, trying to talk with them to hear their concerns and discuss the Constitution and the law, and so they can get a feel for what she would be like as a justice going into the confirmation hearing. The, no, there hasn't been any announcement of when a confirmation hearing might be, but I know that some of the Senate Democrats, Senator Schumer, Senator Dick Durbin, have said that they'd like to try and move things along and possibly have a confirmation vote in mid to late April or early May. Well, we look forward to having you on to discuss that when it happens. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks for having me. Ed Whalen, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, also joins us to weigh in on the SCOTUS nominee. Ed, great to have you here. This has been a season of great change for the court in the last couple of years with some controversial proceedings and confirmation hearings. But Judge Jackson has been confirmed with bipartisan support three times. How likely is that to happen again? Well, look, she uh, received a, three votes, I think, for her D.C. Circuit nomination. She might receive three votes um, this time. This is not a you know, bipartisan uh, nomination or one likely to appeal to uh, Republicans. That said, I don't think this is going to be a highly contentious process. Democrats have the majority. Republicans will respectfully uh, engage uh, Judge Jackson, and I think we'll have grounds to oppose her on the basis of her ju judicial philosophy. In all likelihood, uh, she'll be confirmed uh, probably sometime in April. Let's talk about that judicial philosophy. Um, her record, how is she similar or different from Justice Breyer? Well, it, look, it's difficult when uh, someone has been a district judge, as she has been for some eight years, to, to um, try to find a correspondence between her views and Justice Breyer's. She was a law clerk for Justice Breyer. There's every indication that in judicial ideology, she's a run-of-the-mill progressive. Uh, so I, I doubt that she'll uh, uh, differ very much. Um, but, uh, you know, as with any justice. Uh, there, there are just a lot of tea leaves to, to guess at. Um, I trust that the Biden White House did their job. Uh, she was a favorite of the progressive groups in D.C., so there's every reason to think that um, she will be uh, a, a, a progressive justice. And what about the current docket and petitions? Religious freedom is a banner issue, one that has come up over and over again in the past couple of terms. With another free speech case taken by the court just this week, what can we expect from Judge Jackson on that issue? Well, that's a good question. It's an interesting matter. She actually uh, served on the uh, uh, school board of a Christian school that, that uh, proclaimed uh, orthodox uh, uh, moral beliefs on marriage, sexuality, abortion. Uh, she said at her D.C. Circuit hearing that she um, she really distanced herself from all that. But, you know, she may have a, um, a, a, uh, a, a she, she may not be hostile to religious belief in the way that some others on the left are. That said, uh, you know, her vote is unlikely to be uh, decisive in any of these cases. And Justice Breyer did cross the aisle many times to vote in 9-0 cases in favor of religious freedom. So hopefully that'll be something that we can pray for. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. There's much more ahead, an immigration crisis at sea, invalidated baptisms, and the Shroud of Turin exhibit. Stay right there. There's a humanitarian crisis happening in the Mediterranean. Thousands of refugees coming in on broken-down boats across the sea from war-torn Middle Eastern and African countries seeking freedom in Europe. Many do not make it and drown at sea. The Pope calls it Europe's graveyard. Pope Francis was expected to take part in a meeting of bishops and mayors in Florence, Italy this weekend to address the migrant crisis, but canceled on Friday due to health issues with his knee. But the meeting in Florence, which began on Thursday, goes on without the Holy Father. It gathers some 70 bishops and 60 mayors of major cities of the Mediterranean region to explore answers to various challenges of the migrant crisis. They will look at how the church and governments can stop the mounting death toll and provide more help for refugees arriving on ships. EWTN correspondent Colin Flynn spoke to the Archbishop of Florence to get a better understanding of how the church is already helping migrants. 
We currently manage about 250 places for refugees and migrants. Some of them are to organize the migrants when they first come off the boats. They are to help and offer a warm welcome. On the other hand, we are there to help them integrate into society. The Pope reminds us how to welcome and that we must integrate. Bishops in Florence took time on Thursday, actually canceled meetings and headed to Eucharistic Adoration to pray for peace after learning about the invasion in Ukraine. To give us greater context to the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean, we're joined by the Vice President of the Middle East Research Institute, Ambassador Alberto Fernandez. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. This crisis in the Mediterranean isn't something new. What are the conflicts in the countries bordering the Mare Nostrum that are fueling migration? Well, I would say uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on with you. I would say that the, you know, the crisis is more than conflict. Obviously, there are conflict zones along the Mediterranean, uh, Syria being a major one, uh, Libya being another one, although you don't have a lot of Libyans going to, uh, to Europe. You have Africans from sub-Sahara. But I would say the majority of the people fleeing are not fleeing for um, uh, issues related to persecution or politics or war. They're fleeing for economic reasons. For example, to take one country uh, as an example, we have Spain, the overwhelming majority of the migrants of the people coming into Spain are from Algeria, Morocco, and Senegal. There's no war in any of those countries. So then the Florence Archdiocese that oversees around 250 reception centers uh, for refugees and displaced persons focuses not only on supporting immediate arrivals, but also on offering real paths of integration. What are the challenges with these, this approach, especially, especially because of what you mentioned, that it's not just leaving for war-torn reasons, but economic reasons? Well, I think, you know, one of the challenges for uh, the integration is the nature of the migration flow. The overwhelming majority of the people that are coming are young men uh, between the ages of 18 and 39. They're often uh, young men who are not well-educated in their own languages. Uh, some will be illiterate. So, you, you know, you're bringing in uh, uh, migrant workers, people that are going to be at the bottom of the economic food chain, people who are not well-educated in, uh, in their own culture, in their own language, and you're thrusting them into a very different society. Uh, so the integration problem is, is, is multiplied by all of those factors. Obviously, if you had intact families, families, uh, a husband and a wife and children, that certainly provides a, a much stronger basis for integration. Uh, if people have the language, if people have, you know, uh, some skills, some education, uh, if they're Catholics. Uh, but, you know, many, many factors go into integration and not just one. So I say the biggest risk or the biggest problem is this young male nature of the migration flows, as opposed to, for example, migration, uh, uh, other crises that we see with migration, say Cuba, Cubans fleeing uh, the island and trying to go into the West, into the United States. You have entire families, you have children, you have husbands and wives. In, in the Middle East and in North Africa, you basically have this, uh, this skewed type of, which is remarkable, it's like 70, 80, 90 percent, that type of population. Very interesting on stability and also the kind of migration that we're seeing. This is being addressed by a meeting of the minds of church and civil authorities, a remarkable example of the importance of faith leaders in conflict resolution. And we know the role the church will commit to play, which is pastoral care. But what can we expect from the government officials? You know, the government officials have a challenge that is different than that of the church. I mean, the church has... Uh, the Gospels, and we're, we're called to be, uh, to be sympathetic and active in our help for the poor and the migrant and the homeless. So that's very clear. But for politicians, politicians, uh, governments, uh, they answer to their citizens. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a point of contention there, there's friction there. Uh, I mentioned Spain recently. For example, Spain has the highest youth unemployment in Europe. Uh, and yet is experiencing migrant flows. And you see that in other countries in, in, in Western Europe, 
uh, Italy and Greece that have you know high population, have high uh, unemployment, youth unemployment problems. That's a political issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and it's not easy. And there are all the push-pull factors that bring people to come as migrants or as refugees, which have to do with, you know, the, 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 the safety of, of the place that they're going to, the benefits that they uh, might get. That's why you have this bizarre situation, for example, happening in Europe, of people who have fled to Europe who are already in Europe as refugees or migrants trying to go from, say, France to the United Kingdom because they somehow feel that that is a better situation for them. A great political challenge. Well, we'll be following this closely and also praying for the Holy Father to get better. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you. The new U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Joe Donnelly, was sworn in on Thursday. Donnelly is a Democrat who served six years in the U.S. House of Representatives before serving as Senator of Indiana. An alumnus and professor from the University of Notre Dame, Donnelly taught courses on American politics, public policy, and leadership. He has also practiced law at a firm in D.C. over the last three years. The University of Notre Dame tweeted out a photo of its president, Father John Jenkins, as he gave a blessing to Donnelly during the swearing-in. The Week in Review is next, including a debate about baptism. One wrong word invalidates thousands of sacraments. A look at the ramifications of using we versus I. News from the U.S. Supreme Court with impact on religious liberty tops the Week in Review. Justices have agreed to hear the case of a Colorado website designer who wants to expand her business to include wedding websites. She says the state's anti-discrimination law violates her free speech and religious rights because she objects to doing her work for same-sex couples. The case pits designer Lori Smith, who runs a company called 303 Creative, against Colorado officials who say she's violating Colorado's public accommodation law by declining to provide services. Smith says her refusal is grounded in her Christian faith. In taking the case, the high court said it will only address the free speech claims made in the case. The U.S. Senate is, is, is expected to vote on an abortion bill next week. The Women's Health Protection Act seeks to prohibit many restrictions or bans on abortions or access to abortions, including prohibiting limits on abortion before fetal viability. Pro-life groups warn it could nullify pro-life laws in states across the country. The bill comes as the Supreme Court prepares to issue a ruling on the Dobbs case out of Mississippi that directly challenges Roe v. Wade. With the decision in the 15-week abortion ban case that could overturn Roe, what will life after Roe look like? Next week, EWTN News In-Depth begins a six-part special report exploring the likely debate in the states as abortion laws move to individual legislatures. We have a team of reporters fanning out across the country looking at six specific states with unique and different approaches to the life issue. From strong pro-life to strong pro-abortion states, we're on the ground talking to key people to decipher and understand the next chapter in an issue that dominates the political divide and affects the Catholic vote. Our special report, Life After Roe, Debate in the States, begins next week. Another top story impacting the church out of Arizona. Parishioners were presented to the church for the sacrament of Christian initiation and were washed with water but their baptisms are no longer considered valid. A priest in the Diocese of Phoenix has resigned after the church determined he did not properly perform the sacrament. A notice from the diocese's website states that all of the baptisms he has performed until June 17, 2021 are presumed invalid. The church says over 20 years he baptized thousands. It all boils down to the pronoun the priest used. He used the word, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He should have used the pronoun, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Bishop Thomas Olmsted of the Diocese of Phoenix issued a statement writing, The issue with using we is that it is not the community that baptizes a person, rather it is Christ and Christ alone who presides at all of the sacraments, and so it's Christ Jesus who baptizes. Here to provide some clarity is Reverend Thomas Petrie, the president of the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us. 
First of all, we know that using the right words in many instances is critically important. Can you explain to our viewers why it's so important that the right words were used here? To many, it might seem like an innocent mistake. Well, the sacraments, we believe, are not simply symbols and they're not simply empty rituals marking uh, important moments of our lives, in, even though we do receive the sacraments at important moments of our lives. We believe that the sacraments are actually doing what they say they do, which is to say uh, the sacraments do communicate grace. They communicate the grace that they, uh, that they speak about. And so for the entire history of the church, baptism has always been I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The words matter because we are tangible p creatures and God communicates grace to us the way he created us. And we, we communicate meaning and understanding through tangible things like water or bread and wine and oil and through words. Words are important. They have meaning. And from a layperson's perspective, this can be very unsettling. If a person's baptism is invalid, does that mean the sacraments they received after their baptism, confirmation, marriage, ordination as a priest, are also invalid? Yes, that's that's exactly what it would mean. Um, since this story came out, I myself have been receiving emails from Catholics all over the country asking about their baptism, or they remember the priest or the deacon said this or that instead of instead of the words, or if he added this. You know, sometimes it, they think it's very small, and uh, but it does, and it's a very worrying thing. I mean, the, the the problem here are not the faithful who receive these sacraments. The problem are clerics, you know, priests and deacons who feel that they have a right, apparently, sometimes for good intentions, you know, they think they're being pastoral, uh, to play with the liturgy and to play with the words, which no cleric should ever do. So let's keep going down this terrifying rabbit hole. If an ordination is no longer valid because of a priest's own invalid baptism as a child, does that mean every sacrament performed by that priest is also invalid? Well, it depends on, because there are some sacraments, like his baptisms wouldn't be invalid because anybody can actually baptize, even, even a non-Christian, believe it or not. This, this, this case happened. Uh, it was in Detroit, Father Matthew Hood. It's a rather famous case. This happened a couple years ago. Uh, he was watching a video of his baptism about a year after he was ordained, or a few years after he was ordained, and realized that um, he was not properly baptized. And so the Archdiocese of Detroit really did have to go seek out all of the people he had married. That meant all the masses he had celebrated were invalid. All of those hosts were not in fact consecrated. Um, and so that, that Matthew Hood had to be baptized, confirmed, ordained a deacon and ordained a priest, which the Archdiocese did in a matter of days. So there are Catholics out there who believe that laypersons can baptize under special circumstances. You mentioned something like that. Are there proper times to do that? And I guess that their pronouns better be right. <laughs> that's, well, that's right. I mean, yeah, if you're going to do it, do it right. Um, but yeah, that's always been the case. Anybody can baptize. Um, now, in the church, normally it's usually a cleric that should baptize, but certainly in missionary territories, often it can be a layperson who baptizes. Um, think of all the Protestant baptisms, you know, they don't have the priesthood, so a lot of Protestant baptisms are, are valid. Um, but this has also been an issue sometimes in receiving uh, Protestants into the Catholic Church. There are some denominations that don't baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but baptize in the name of Jesus Christ instead. Uh, when those Protestants come into the church, they do have to be uh, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that reflection of what we believe is very important. There has been some criticism in the secular media uh, that this is just the church being nitpicky, the church being difficult. Mm -hmm. You stress the importance of words. And I know that I heard that comparison in a couple of reflections that I read online about comparing it to the Miranda rights. No one says that, that, that you can mess those up. You can actually be free from a conviction if they mess them up. So how do you respond to that criticism? Well, I would say this is a church matter, and this is what we believe, and the secular world has no right or uh, reason to tell us what we can and cannot do or what we should and should not believe. I would note also in a sort of uh, in, in a rebuttal to this that it's usually the same people who are criticizing the church about I versus we pronouns that are also usually um, hammering about people's preferred pronouns and their own gender identity. So somehow those pronouns matter in gender identity, but not uh, for us with regard to what we believe about the faith. It, it, it's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. So just to calm everyone a little bit, um, the final question, we're running out of time. 
what can you say to people who think that this happens all the time? Is it really that prominent, messing up words in the sacraments or even in the consecration during Mass? No, I don't think it's that prominent. I think this was a, something that was happening with some clerics. I don't think it's that prominent. But I would also say there's no reason to fear. Um, this would be another discussion we don't have time for. But, you know, if you do find out that you you were baptized with the wrong words, you know, get that. That's easily taken care of, and everything can be easily taken care of. If you don't know, just trust that you were baptized with the right formula because— um, God does not hold us responsible for that which we do not know or cannot control. And God, while he guarantees the sacraments, he himself is not bound or limited by them. So he can give grace even if you've been invalidly baptized. And we can trust and take comfort in that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monsi. The priest who resigned from the parish in Phoenix where this happened is still in good standing. He has not disqualified himself from his vocation and ministry. The diocese says he will dedicate his energy to helping those who were invalidly baptized. It was the linen cloth lying there that was the first piece of evidence that Jesus had risen from the, the dead. Next, exploring a new exhibit opening at the Museum of the Bible about the Shroud of Turin. I talked to a leading scholar who explains the Shroud's historic, scientific, and theological importance when we return. When you first look at the Shroud, people don't, don't understand how the body was actually wrapped, mm -hmm. and, um, but, it, but he was wrapped lengthwise, and as we see here, and I think it's very important, um, you know, because you know, you know, the question is, what did, what did Peter and John see when they went to the tomb that Sunday morning? I think they saw the, the, the shroud exactly like it is here, undisturbed, except the body's gone. It just collapsed on itself. A new exhibit at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., helps visitors dive into the secrets of the Shroud of Turin. EWTN is one of the sponsors of this exhibit, which provides an interactive experience with a replica of the shroud as the real shroud remains in Turin, Italy. I spoke to a man who has studied the shroud for more than 40 years, Russ Brialt. He's the president and founder of the Shroud of Turin Education Project. He shares the shroud's history, mysteries surrounding it that have baffled scientists for decades, and a glimpse of this unique exhibit. Russ, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for welcoming us to this exhibit that you're putting, helping to put together here at the Museum of the Bible. Why Turin? Why the Shroud of Turin, not the Shroud of Jerusalem or Israel? Okay. Well, it's been in Turin since 1578, hence we call it that, the Shroud of Turin. And um, now the Shroud has been in private ownership for over 500 years, from 1453 until 1983, it was owned by the Savoy family. And all the kings of Italy came out of the Savoy family, either by blood or by, or by marriage. And so, and so in, in 1578, uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Borromeo of, of, of Milan was going to make a pilgrimage to Chambéry, France, where the shroud was at that time. Now that's on the other side of the Alps. And so here this Cardinal was ailing, old, but he felt the need to go and pay uh, homage and venerate the Shroud because he credited it with saving Milan from the plague. So, and so when the, uh, when the King of Italy found out that he was going to do this, he said, well, no, we can't have him do that. So they moved the shroud from Chambéry to Turin, which is where the, uh, where the King of, uh, where the Savoy family had their primary residence and they, it was the, that was the home of the royal palace. And, um, but that way it also, you know, it made it much easier for Cardinal Borromeo to actually get to Turin as opposed to Chambéry. There were no, there were no mountains to go over. And it's, um, and so, uh, and that's how it ended up in Turin. And is that where it got its name? Is that because, or is that because that's where everyone discovered it and started testing it? Well, prior to Turin, it was simply just called the Shroud of Christ, and, but but it, it it just became known as the Shroud of Turin, and it's um in the um but you know the 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 shroud was really um, somewhat obscure as just kind of being mostly an Italian thing, and Catholic, you know certainly Catholic and and but then it in 1898 is when it was photographed for the very first time, and then that's when they 
uh, found the, that, that for some reason the shroud looks a whole lot clearer in a photo negative, which is, which is you know, contrary to what we would expect. And, um, and, so, and, and so this was uh, again validated in 1931 when it was photographed the second time with much better film, much better technology. And sure enough, the shroud has this very mysterious negative image on it. And in the photo negative, the shroud li literally comes to life, looks much more lifelike in the photo negative. And um, which is, uh, you know, it's, it, this, this got the attention of, of the scientific world. And then, of course, we had the whole team of scientists go to Turin in 78. And, and um, one of the most important things that, that they discovered is that, you know, not only is there no visible trace of any kind of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, stain, but the image affects only the top one to two microfibers. Now, each individual thread is made up of about 200 microfibers. So that means that this image resides on about 1% of a single thread. It's exceedingly superficial. It does not penetrate through to the other side. So if you look at the shroud, there's, there's blood stains, there's water stains, there is, there is burns from a fire in 1532. You know, if you flip the cloth over, you'll see all that stuff, but you won't see the image of the man. The image of the man is a completely superficial image. And so this is, and it's, and it's uniform in intensity, top to bottom, front to back. I mean, you think you need a piece of technology to accomplish that. And so this is, this is part of the scientific mystery of the shroud. And so when you allege, so when someone wants to allege that this is the work of some medieval artist, okay, come up with that. Show me how you do that with, um, and it's uh, that a image that is, that contains distance information, it, it, a photo, a perfect photo negative image. And when you talk about this image, the way that this was then photographed in later years was with special technology that you described for me. And I am going to mess up the words. So can you tell us about the special technology? Well, it was, it was analyzed with what's, what's called a VP8 image analyzer. Now at the time, this is like 1975, um, it was a, it was a simple machine, but it did one thing and it did it very well. It simply assessed uh, light and dark and assigned elevation based on lights and darks. So the, the darker the image, the higher the elevation. The lighter the image, the lower the elevation. And when you, and if, so if, if you scan a, a standard reflected light photograph or, or even a painting, it's all um, a distortion. But you scan a picture of the shroud and it zooms off that view screen in perfect three-dimensional contour. And this is what got the scientists excited and actually was the catalyst for the whole shroud project to, uh, to, come, to, to, to come together. Has any other uh, scientific techniques uh, been, been employed in trying to figure out what's the authenticity of the shroud? Well, in terms of authenticity of, of the shroud, you have to go back to what the STIRP team found. The, 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 that's the Shroud of Turin Research Project in 1978. And exhaustive analysis, five days and nights, round the clock, 120 hours, hands-on with spectroscopy and x-radiography and infrared thermography and, 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 and photomicroscopy and on and on. And they determined, you see, the question is, what caused the image? What is the cause of this image? And there's this either or proposition. It's really important. In other words, the Shroud of Turin either is the authentic burial shroud of Jesus or it's not. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then what is it? If it's not authentic, then it must be the result of some kind of human effort, either as, a, either as an artwork or as, a, or as a purposeful fraud. I mean, so, so what did the SERP team find? There's no evidence of any kind of paint, ink, mm -hmm. dye, pigmentation, stain. There are no artistic substances on the cloth to account for the image. You have a whole pattern of blood stains that correlate with the wounds of Christ, crown of thorns, scourging all over the body, nail wounds in the wrist, nail wounds in the feet. I mean, is it just paint? Is it animal blood? Is it human blood? Is it blood from actual wounds? I mean, come on, five days, 120 hours, round the clock, it can't possibly be that hard to figure out whether something's the work of an artist or not. But apparently it is, mm. because the blood is blood. AB, AB, um, AB blood type with human male DNA. We found that out in 1995. And so the plot certainly thickens now. 
And so, you know, if you're going to allege that this is the work of some artist, then we certainly don't know how we did it. What does the exhibit consist of? What are we looking at here? This exhibit is marvelous. I mean, you're there. You're going to go through a historical timeline here. You'll you'll look at you'll review some of the science. There are uh, eight various interactive types of displays where you could you know it, you, you you press a button and it pops up and tells you what what it's all about. It's um, there'll there'll be an example of the VP8 image analyzer here, which was used back in the 70s to to determine that the shroud actually has distance to three dimensional information um, in, embedded in it. Um, so this this is a, a marvelous exhibit, and uh, you'll spend some time here. Russ Brialt obviously knows the history and science of the Shroud, but he also has beautiful faith in sight. He shared his thoughts on the Shroud's theology. I want to tell you what the Shroud really is, okay? Now, there are four words that are commonly used to describe the Shroud. It's called a relic. It's called a mystery. It's called, a, it's called an artifact. It's called a symbol. All those words are fine, but they really don't tell you very much. So I got to think of there has to be another idea, another concept. So I looked at the scripture and looked at all the words that, that um, would say what Jesus accomplished for us mm. on the cross. And there were four of them. We have been bought, purchased, redeemed, ransomed. What are those words? Those are all words of transaction. Mm -hmm. A transaction has occurred. A payment has been made on our behalf. So when Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, what did they see? They saw the record of the transaction. And when they opened it up, what did they see? They saw the price that was paid. And, and they saw the crown of thorns. They saw scourging all over the body, wound in the side, and then wounds in the wrist and the feet. Now every, so not, not, not only is the shroud a receipt, it's an itemized receipt documenting everything that was paid to purchase our salvation. The Shroud of Turin exhibit opens February 26th and runs through July 31st of this year. More details on the Museum of the Bible's website. And that's a wrap on this edition of EWTN News In Depth. Remember, next week, the beginning of our multi-part reporting series, Life After Row, Debate in the States. Join us for that and let us join together to pray for peace in Ukraine and for all those lives in danger. We'll see you next week.